as I was saying that, I realized I didn't hear record. So welcome, yeah. Dr. Evan. <laughs> Glad we got it going. Uh, thank you. Um, there was somebody that was mentioning in the chat that they seem to not hear anything. Um, I think it might be an individual basis, but maybe we can just help them out. Um, while you do that, thank you again for the lovely introduction. So this is part two of the webinar series on lower extremity. We will be talking all about the hip. Um, and I'm going to just kind of dive right in. Uh, let's see. Okay, so an overview. Today we're going to do pretty similar to the last uh, series of lectures. If you miss those, that's okay. This is kind of an independent topic in itself, but we will be referencing some of the stuff in the last lecture, which is all recorded. It's going to be on the, the YouTube page on Active Sports Therapy, and I'll have a little link to that at the end of this one as well. Okay. So we'll be covering the general anatomy of the hip. So that includes the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, and the nerves involved there. Um, and then some of the more common injuries. We're really going to be focusing in on bone because there's just so much to talk about in terms of the bones uh, of the hip and um, some of the conditions that, that are caused by it. We'll talk about the treatment and management plans uh, of those conditions, as well as what we can do preventatively. And there's actually a fair amount of prevention in this lecture. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And then there's also going to be some home care stretches. I've picked out three that we're going to go over at the end that I think are uh, it's a really good start for somebody that doesn't know where to begin with, you know, exercising or stretching the hip. That would be a great spot. And as always, you can type in your questions. Um, and just let us know, and Renee can can kind of call me out if uh, if it's relevant at the time, so I can answer that. Uh, in terms of qualifications, I have a bachelor's of science in human biology, and I'm also a doctor of chiropractic, both from the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon. So let's dive into the hip joint, and what exactly is it? It is the connection between your upper uh, the upper part of your your leg. And your pelvis. So it's a ball and socket joint, which we can see beautifully visualized here. And it's that connection between the femur and what we call the acetabulum. So I'm highlighting that here. The acetabulum is that socket-like shape of the hip that it's connecting into. So we would refer to the hip joint as the, the combination of that, the femoral acetabular joint or the FA joint. I'm just going to call it the hip joint, but this is exactly what I'm referring to. Um, is this one here. And there is a little bit of a bony landmark that I want you guys to be aware of called the greater trochanter. I'll put a little green square around it. This is like a bony growth that kind of grows off the side. Um, and not only is it a great landmark that we can kind of find where we are on the body, but there's a lot of muscle attachments that go right into there. So it's gonna come up in the future. And I'm just gonna point that one out again. So let's let's look at an actual human uh, x-ray and see what this looks like. It's, it's remarkable um, how similar it is to the images. And I'm going to kind of draw on the right side here. And then you can look at the left for comparison, just so that we can find these landmarks. So the first thing is I'm going to show you that acetabulum, so that socket that it's connecting into. So if I put this red line over top of it, this is the very base of the, the socket. Um, and you can see that it has some depth to it. In fact, the lip of it is, is quite far up. So it um, allows the socket to fit in a couple of centimeters so that uh, it's not easily getting dislocated, okay? The head of the femur, I'm gonna highlight in green, and you can see that it really fits in there very well. And there is a nice bit of gap between the two surfaces. Um, again, they're looking really smooth and healthy in this image, so that's, that's really great. Um, and it's a pretty uniform gap from the top to the bottom, which is also a, a nice healthy sign that we like to see. And then lastly, I want to point out that greater trochanter, that kind of bony bump that we see, this is the widest portion of the hips. So you'll see, even if we look up kind of at the, uh, the top of the pelvis there, this is even wider than that. So this is kind of the, the widest part of our body, um, uh, lower body, I should say. And it's, it's kind of the defining feature of kind of that bell-shaped curve that we get. So if we go back to the images, if we add just a couple more layers on, we can see highlighted on the left image in red um, that there's some basically connective tissue uh, components that surround the joint. 
and then even highlighted in blue, there's a ligament that comes straight out the, the end of the bone, holding everything in place. So basically, this is your connection in your movement between your pelvis and your lower extremity, okay? So I want to help people find this on themselves, and this is how we would do it, okay? So the surface anatomy, this person is pressing right where we would expect it. So the very lateral outermost portion of the leg, kind of near the bottom of the buttock. And if we look on the right side image, if we overlay a pelvis, you can see that that greater trochanter is sitting at the very widest portion of your hip. And it's basically right where that gluteal fold is coming across, okay? So if you um, wanna find this on yourself, I'm just gonna stand up if you guys can see me as well. So if you look at the side of your leg, the gluteal fold, kind of the bottom part of your glutes, you come out towards the side and you press in, it's gonna be this kind of bony structure. You're not gonna sink in a lot like down here, it's quite soft, but if you press right in, that is not the hip joint, but this is the greater trochanter. If we follow that more inwards, about halfway in the leg, that, which I'll highlight now, that would be the hip joint itself, okay? So I hope that gives people a bit of an idea of where this joint would be in your own body. Okay, so let's talk about some of the bony issues that we have. Well, one is bone shape. Um, sometimes bones aren't formed quite in the correct manner. Sometimes the angles are different between people. So for instance, if we drew a line through the head of the femur like that, and then one through the shaft of the femur, there is an angle and a relationship there that varies between people. It's not always gonna be exactly the same, and this can lead to um, variations. So we'll talk about that. Two would be bony changes. So over time, um, bones can basically degrade a little bit. Um, most commonly, we're thinking about something like osteoarthritis, also known as like the wear and tear of a joint. Um, that can lead to bony changes. So here you can see they've kind of highlighted in red where you might feel pain due to that. So we're going to discuss that. And then third would be something like a breakage. Now, it's not, unfortunately, it's not too uncommon to actually break a hip. Um, and it does have some serious in implications. So we're gonna talk about um, breaking your hip as well. So one, let's start with the bone shape. There's something called a Q angle, and we're gonna discuss what that means for us. So the first line that we would draw would be right through the, through the bottom of the leg. If we just drew it straight up and down, um, we get this line I'm highlighting in solid red. And then if we were to measure the angle that the, the femur comes off of that line, which I'm gonna highlight again, the angle between that is what we call a Q angle, okay? Now, typically this is sitting somewhere, you know, 10 to 15 degrees or so, but sometimes it can be even more than that. And if it starts to approach 20 or more degrees, we're looking at something called genuvalgum, more commonly known as knock knee, right? So this is typically seen in children, probably younger ages, somewhere in, you know, four to five, you might start noticing this in your kid. Um, and for the most part, it's self-resolving. If we just continue to watch and monitor, the kid will tend to grow out of it before the ages of around eight. Um, if you still have a significant amount by the age of 10, then there would be considerations of um, trying to provide some sort of intervention, whether it would be surgery or casting or, or bracing, what, what not. Um, but for the most part, self-limiting and people will resolve this. Um, but it is just one more way that we can measure um, the angles of the bones and it can basically result in a condition like knocking. Okay. There's other genetic conditions. This one is called osteogenesis imperfecta, basically um, bony growth that is imperfect. And it is a genetic condition passed down. And in some cases, there's about 19 variations. Some of those variations can unfortunately be fatal. Um, but you can imagine, you know, the, the connective tissue in this case is not forming correctly. They're missing a genetic component 
that allows them to make stronger bones. And the, the brittleness of their bones allows them to kind of bend and warp. And you can imagine this femur should be fairly straight, right? And it, it looks really quite curved. The image on the, on the left is from um, a front to back view. So you can see it's really bowing to the right. And then the image on the right would be kind of a, from the inner to the outer side of the leg. So it's bowing quite a bit forward as well. This makes it very difficult to stand on, to apply any stress. And if you did apply too much stress, you can even break it. I've heard people with this condition, you know, even just stepping off of a curb, um, trying to get to, to work or something, uh, that, that much of a gap can be enough to cause a breakage. Um, and I, I remember actually one of my professors, um, they said that they had a student with this. And by the time they had hit um, undergrad, they had broken 17 plus bones. So depending on the various form, bones aren't forming quite in the shape that we like. They're more brittle and a chance of breaking them. Okay, so two other bony issues that we might encounter, osteoarthritis. Okay, this is probably the most common form of arthritis that we'll see in, in our clinic. Um, and basically what it is, is the wear and tear of that joint. So on the left, you see that the femoral head should have this really smooth, it, it really does look almost white in the body. Um, and it's a very smooth cartilage that allows the hip joint to move um, without restriction. Now, if this starts to wear down, whether it's from excessive uh, activity or injury or just over time, um, we get bony growth underneath and these can narrow the joint down, they can rub into each other, they can cause stiffness and pain, even swelling in the area. So we basically start to shift from the left image to the right. Uh, in addition, you might start to lose some joint mobility. Um, and you might get what we call crepitus. Crepitus is the creaking kind of crackling sound that joints can make, um, particularly common in like knees, for instance, if you've had like a creaky knee, that's what we refer to as crepitus. So uh, arthritis in general, our goal would be to um, try to prevent this from, from proceeding at a rate um, that it that's too quick, right? We can't undo arthritis, but we can try to manage it and prevent uh, this, the continued degradation of that joint. Okay. And then three other bony things that can go wrong are hip fractures. So it's globally estimated that the risk of a hip fracture in women is 18%, and it's around 6% in men. That risk increases as we get older, and the two biggest risk factors for it are a decrease in bone mineral density, which I'll go over what that means in a second, as well as an increased rate of falling. And the most common place that it does break is this middle fracture one, which I'm pointing the arrow to, what we call the femoral neck, so kind of between the head of the femur and the greater trochanter. So how can we, uh, well, okay. First, I'm going to start with, with typically what a, what a hip should, should be doing. When we apply a load, a stress, like a, like a physical weight um, that's applying a force through the hip, the hip redistributes that through these tensile and compressive systems. It's not too important to know the names of them, but basically imagine that if you put a force through, it passes along these lines. So you can see on the, on the left side here, these red ones near the head of the femur called the medial compressive system. If we looked at an X-ray, you can literally see that the body is putting these stress lines in, right? So you can see that right there, right? And then Likewise, from left to right, it's also putting in this lateral tensile system. And you can see that like the body has really um, basically remodeled the hip to allow these stresses to pass through it. So what I'm referring to here is um, the remodeling of bone. And this is something that a lot of people have heard about when it's uh, in regards to, for example, weight bearing exercise, right? Um, you want to make sure that you're doing weight bearing exercise to keep a certain amount of bone density. And the idea here is we're relying on the remodeling of bone and what exactly that is. Um, oh, sorry, before I continue, the zone of weakness 
is this triangular like space between all of these um, lines of stress. Okay. And you'll notice it's right where the most common spot for fractures is. Uh, so making sure that we remodel the bone correctly to uh, handle all the stresses we put on it is important. And that remodeling process follows what we call Wolf's Law. So the bone will adapt in response to the demand we place on it. So that's where the idea of weight-bearing exercise helping your bones comes from. If we were to apply a stress, so for example, on this right image, a compressive force right to the top of that bone and the bones curved, then we're gonna have less of a stress on the outer side and a bigger stress on the inner part of that curve. So what our body does is it gets that signal and it says, well, we need to start putting more bone down on the inner part of this curve. There's too much stress here. And then what it does is it puts more bone on that inside and it takes away a bit of the bone on the outside. And then it remodels it so that when that force comes a second time, the weight is evenly distributed, equal forces on both sides of the bone. And the way that it's doing that is it's signaling these cells, which I, I'm kind of outlining on the left here, osteoclasts go in and they kind of eat up and they chew a bit of that bone out. And then we put osteoblasts there and it rebuilds that bone and it, it remineralizes it. So it's this constant give and take of rebuilding based on the stresses that we give bones, which is why they suggest weight bearing exercise to apply a light stress to cause this system to take effect. Um, this leads me to bone mineral density. So um, in a typical bone, what we would expect is this kind of image on the left. Um, a couple of these air pockets evenly distributed throughout the bone and a lot of these little interconnecting bridges. So anytime there's a force, it travels through all of these bridges and it supports itself. As we start to lose density, these bridges become more and more sparse and the air pockets are getting larger and larger and larger. And any amount of force that you apply through them might be more likely to break now because they're going through less bridges. So how does bone density change over time? Well, it's really related to our age. So we can see on this graph here, the time we're in our 20s, really our late 20s and our early 30s, that's pretty much peak bone mass for both sexes. And then after that, males have a pretty steady decline as we get older, and females, you'll see that they really start to drop around the 50s, and that's because of menopause. So hormones are really also um, in control of our bone density, and as women go through menopause, the hormonal changes lead to a uh, pretty significant drop in, in bone mineral density, which is in part why before the, the risk of a hip fracture is significantly higher in females, particularly as we get older. So how can we improve this? You know, are there any steps we can take? Well, the first thing we want to do is treat any underlying condition that might be causing that. Um, these are often uh, kind of gastrointestinal-like conditions or dietary things like bulimia, if you're not getting enough nutrients in the first place. Celiac disease can disrupt the absorption of, of um, certain molecules that we might need, like calcium. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're treating any of those conditions first. Second, we want to make sure that we are getting enough of, of the minerals that we do need. So calcium and vitamin D can help um, absorb calcium. So we want to make sure that we're getting lots of that, especially in Canada. We're heading into winter. It's going to be dark, dark, dark soon. And vitamin D is typically something we get from the sun. So you can always get like a supplement. Um, sometimes there's fortified foods at the grocery store, things like cereals and milks can be fortified with it. So you can always just check um, the back of a food label and see if you're getting enough vitamin D from the foods you regularly eat. Um, three, regular exercise. So that was what I was talking about, about kind of doing weight bearing exercise, but really any regular amount of exercise is gonna help um, stress the bones just enough that we're causing some stimulation for, for um, bony remodeling. And then four would be medications. So if you've kind of surpassed a, a certain point where you're losing too much, then it might be worth talking to your MD. There are certain medications like bisphosphonates that can help um, bring back some bone density and, and prevent further loss as well.
Okay, and then the other big risk factor was the uh, the increased rate of falling. So how can we prevent that? First thing we want to address, balance issues, okay? So if you're having vision troubles, you have blurred vision, double vision, you need to get that addressed. So make sure that you're going, getting your eye exams, updating glasses and prescriptions in that regard. If you have instability, maybe you've rolled an ankle in the past, um, you're feeling unstable, we can definitely do treatment even in our office regarding um, stabilization protocols, strengthening certain muscles to help you with that. Um, we'd also want to check if you have orthostatic hypotension, which would be if you ever got up too quick and then you feel that kind of dizziness, um, we'd want to be aware if that's something you have. Maybe we don't go straight from lying down to standing. Maybe we go to seated for a little bit. We wait and then we go to standing. Right, so these little tweaks can help um, address balance. And then there's always walking aids. If you needed a cane or um, a walk, we can do that. Environmental changes that you could do at home, perhaps um, getting a railing in the shower would be a good idea with a non-slip mat. Um, showers can be one of the more common areas to fall. So we wanna make sure that that's a, a safe place for you. And then clutter free. So making sure that you're not gonna trip over anything. And that also means having a pretty well lit environment during the day and particularly at night. So maybe a nightlight would be a good idea if you're getting up to go to the bathroom at night. Uh, and then three is to understand that, you know, you might need help. So if you need regular visits to your doctor, make sure that you're booking those. If you um, are to the point where you might need assisted living or maybe just uh, help on occasion, make sure you're reaching out to people in your, your uh, uh, social network to, to make sure that that's happening as well. Because we really wanna prevent falls as much as possible. Unfortunately, once you fall once, the risk of falling um, tends to compound itself, it increases over time. So anything we can do ahead of time to be preventative is, is really, really good. So that was a lot on bones. We're gonna jump into ligaments now, and it's not a whole lot. Um, the, the ligaments around the hip are pretty much 360. So you can see the far left image, this is from the back view, and the middle image is from the front. And you can see they're basically designed in this twisted like motion. And what that does is it really helps secure the hip joint in place and is providing tension in any motion. So no matter where we rotated our hip, one of those ligaments is in tension and it's keeping the, uh, the ball and socket joint nice and close together. And one of the ones I really wanted to point out that's quite unique to the hip is that what we call the ligamentum teres. And it's this one I'm gonna to point to the arrow to. It's cut in this image, but basically it's the very head of the femur actually has a ligament coming right out of the surface. It's unlike any other joint. And that is going to hold it nice and tight into the socket. So um, kind of a unique adaptation for our hip. And then we have one here, the IT band, also known as the iliotibial band. This isn't actually in the hip joint. So if you look on the right, you can see it's sitting off to the side, but it covers the hip joint and even the knee. So I'm going to put it in this lecture. It's a really, really massive band. It goes all the way from the top of that iliac crest all the way down to the, uh, to the lower portion of your knee. And it is a really thick, strong, like fibrous connective tissue. And it has an itty bitty muscle in it, which I've highlighted in blue called the TFL, the tensor fascia lata. So that's this guy right up here. Now, when that muscle contracts, it does tighten this band all the way down. And you can see on the right image that they've highlighted the bottom portion of it in red. That's typically where the pain from IT band syndrome would occur. Most common in joggers, runners, sprinters, um, anybody that's doing that sort of um, kind of sprinting running motion tends to um, tighten this muscle and, sorry, not muscle, band. And it rubs over top of that knee on the outer side. So you get this kind of sharp, um, irritating pain on the lateral portion of your knee. Now, um, when we want to release, release this muscle, we often try to do something like rolling, like on a foam roller. 
um, because it is such a strong connective tissue that the typical muscle release isn't going to be quite as effective. So we need something a bit stronger, um, which is why foam rollers are, are so effective on, on treating this condition. One of the other things I wanted to do is wrap this back to a condition we just talked about called Jenny Valgum or, or knock knee. And if we look at the muscle from the front here, you can imagine that TFL is tightening up and it's adding to the tension in the IT band, right? So it's really contracting here. So if we zoom in right on the knee, what does that mean? We're getting this kind of outer force, this force that's pulling it out to the side. And some of that is bringing that lower knee out. And what does that remind us of? Well, it looks a lot like knock knee where you're pulling that lower portion of the leg out to the side. Now, I think it would be unlikely to say that this would be purely the cause of somebody's knock knee, but I think it would be something that would need to be addressed, right? We have to check, see how tight it is. Can we loosen it? And maybe it's um, one of the factors leading to their condition. Okay. So we're gonna dive into muscles and there's a lot of hip flexors. Uh, there's a lot of them, but I'm just gonna kind of simplify it a bit here. The green arrows are pointing to two muscles that kind of bind together, collectively called your iliopsoas muscle. Now, this is a big, big hip flexor. And what I mean by when I, when I say hip flexor is if it contracts, it brings your knee towards your chest. So that we call that hip flexion. And then there's some other ones. So if you think about, uh, for example, your quads, right? The top of your, your leg, when those ones contract, that's also gonna bring your knee towards your chest. And then there's even the, the ones we have highlighted here. This one is rec fem. This is part of that quad muscle. And then this one on top, this S-like shape, sometimes referred to as the soccer muscle. It's the sartorius. All of these guys collectively, more or less, are bringing your knee to your chest. And I would recommend, if you haven't, we dived a bit more into this in the SI lecture, so you can always pop back over there. We talked about what neutral pelvis is and the really important role of these uh, in maintaining that. Okay, so more on this lecture, I wanna focus on the back side, so the glutes. So we've often heard about the glutes, it's a pretty popular muscle group, but there's a lot more muscles going on here. So the very outer layer, if we look at the very first surface level layer, that's the ones on the left, that's your glute maximus and your glute medius, okay? So these are really kind of those outer ones that are defining the shape of our buttock um, and their main role is when they contract, they do the inverse. So instead of bringing your knee to your chest, they're bringing your knee backwards now. Okay, um, so that's why, you know, stairs are really good at training these because every time you take a step up, this is the muscle that's going to pull it back. If we remove those outer superficial muscles and we look underneath, that's when we get the right side. So we get two particular muscles that I want to talk about, glute minimus and the piriformis. Okay, the piriformis is going to come up uh, a lot, especially in um, sciatic, uh, sciatica. Okay, and these muscles are what we would call hip stabilizers. So I'm going to show you a bit about what that means. So if we were to take a step, like if we were just to hold our body and just stand on one leg, the reason that my pelvis doesn't shift down is because that glute minimus, glute medius, and piriformis, they're all holding my hip at, at a proper level. Okay, so for example, if I were to walk towards you and I take a step and I lift off, I'm not sinking down because these are always holding my, my pelvis in a, in a correct horizontal position. And then when I step off, I don't sink down here. I keep my pelvis up and it basically helps us maintain a pelvic neutral plane, okay? So these muscles are constantly firing, and I, I get it a lot when I kind of dig in here, people go, why are those so sore? Well, they're firing all the time. Every time you're doing an exercise, even just walking, they are constantly working to keep your pelvis uh, neutral, okay? So if we, um, if we look at where these muscles attach, it goes all back to that very first one I was talking about, that greater trochanter, this kind of bony bump. Um, it's, it's basically the attachment point for 
um, you know, six or seven of these, these muscles in our glute area, okay? Now, let's get, dive into nerves. I know everybody likes the nerve part of, of these. So we're going to dive into the sciatic nerve again, because this is such an important nerve that we get um, irritation in all the time. So this is just a reminder. The sciatic nerve gets all these different nerve roots from different levels, L4, 5, S1, S2, and S3. So that's all these different colors, and it forms this big one I'm highlighting in red, right? And that's forming kind of right in the middle of your glute. And it leads to that famous condition, sciatica. So that, that is when you have pain traveling down the sciatic nerve, which again, starts all the way in those lumbars, L4 and down. And it's traveling down the back side of your leg, through the glute, through the thigh, into the calf, and all the way down to the foot. So if you get irritation, it can be from any of the following. It could be nerve compression from a muscle that's too tight, bony pressure, a herniated disc, even chemical irritation. If you fell on it and it gets swollen and the chemical markers are being released, that's enough. Um, other symptoms you might experience with this that are fairly common would be numbness, tingling, or weakness, and a little bit more rare would be something like a bowel or bladder change. If you have any of those ones at the end with a red flag, definitely uh, go see whoever it is um, that, that you're seeing for your care, whether it's a chiropractor, a physiotherapist, an ND, those ones are a little bit of red flags. We just wanna make sure that you're okay. So be, be sure to see somebody if you have those. Um, and then what I wanted to touch on is, is piriformis syndrome in particular. I kind of mentioned this one last time in passing, but I wanna go through it because it is something we see a fair amount. Um, and it's, it's fairly treatable as well. So piriformis syndrome is basically a form of sciatica where the sciatic nerve is being compressed by the piriformis muscle. So that's this one right here. I'm going to highlight it in red. So you can see that this muscle goes right over top of the nerve, which I'm highlighting that goes right under it. So if we were to press on that muscle, or if I were to get you to contract it or... Um, um, try to maneuver that muscle, it would likely reproduce your symptoms if you have piriformis syndrome, because any amount of pressure is going to um, build up on that nerve underneath, and you're going to get the symptoms, right? Whether it be pain down the leg, numbness, tingling, you name it, okay? Now, there is a slight variation. In most people, we have the scenario on the right, where the nerve completely passes underneath of the muscle, but some people have the scenario on the left where the nerve actually pierces the muscle. This is less common, but we do believe that people that have um, part or the whole um, sciatic nerve pierce the muscle are more prone to getting piriformis syndrome. Because you can imagine any time that muscle contracts, um, it, it's not really a question as if, if it compresses the nerve, but it does compress the nerve, right? So we, um, in, in that scenario, we are um, suspecting that you're more prone to it and we would, we would want to make sure that we're addressing, you know, stretches to keep that muscle as loose as possible, okay? There's no way for us to really know that um, without um, really getting in there to look. So it's more of a kind of an after the fact finding, but um, something to be aware of for sure. Uh, in terms of treatment, there's lots of things that we can do for this and I'm going to touch on that here. So the first thing to always do is identify which of those tissues is being injured, okay? So we talked about bones. Um, so that would be the kind of, is the, the shape of the bone, is the, is the joint okay? Then we had the ligaments on top of that, we had muscles, and then we even had nerves, right? So the first job is which one of these structures and which one of these tissues is irritated? And then from there, we can use some of these other um, tools to, to treat that. So adjustments, uh, chiropractors are, are probably most known for adjusting. Um, that's when we're contacting either side of that joint and giving it um, a corrective um, push in the right direction. So if it's out of place, we're correcting the, the position. If it's not moving enough in a certain way, we can correct that. Um, and it's pretty common to think that chiros only work on the back. We do adjust um, extremities as well. So I can uh, adjust hips and knees and ankles and you name it. I can adjust almost every joint. So um, that's definitely something that we would consider. Mobilizations is a very, very similar process to adjusting, 
but it takes these slow, gradual sweeping motions to induce movement. Uh, and then we would want to address posture and biomechanics. So um, for a lot of people, I get a lot of office workers. It's pretty common to see people with um, hip pain from prolonged sitting, for example. So we would try to address, you know, can we, can we get you to stand regularly? Can we consider a, a standing desk for part of the day? Can we take little micro breaks? Um, you know, when you are seated, how's your posture? These are all the things um, that we would start to talk about and, and discuss. Additionally, it would be uh, lots of warehouse workers also get this, where they're not quite picking up with their knees and their hips and they're using their low back. This can lead to all sorts of problems. So we'd want to address the mechanics of, of how to properly lift as well. If it was a muscle issue, um, for example, like the piriformis syndrome, we would definitely consider soft tissue release. So this would be something like muscle relaxation therapy um, or active release therapy, which is really, um, our clinic specializes in that. So there's um, basically, a, it's a, a specialized technique to really induce changes in the tissue um, to allow it to relax and, um, help with the healing process as well. And then we always have the modalities that we can refer to as well. So something like laser um, or ultrasound, they both provide energy and, and heat to the area to help with healing. IFC stands for interferential current. So that'd be kind of like if you ever heard of those Dr. Ho commercials where they have those pads that pass electricity through, it's kind of like a really high-end version of that. And then there's also game ready. So if it was more of like a recent injury, like a sporting injury, we might wanna bring down the inflammation. We would use something like game ready, which is um, kind of like a, a, an iced sleeve that we would put over the top of the injured area. So that's kind of the start of how we would manage pain. How can we prevent it? And what kind of home care you can do? Well, I think the first thing to do is, is start with that previous lecture of lower body posture understanding where your body should be in space, how the muscles are involved. Um, take a look back at that. Make sure that you are reviewing, um, you know, uh, basically pelvic neutral that we talked about. Uh, and then we also want to address, again, the ergonomics and mechanics of your, your workplace setup. Okay, so if you are on a computer a lot of the day, how can we address that? And then stretching and strength building. I'm gonna get into some of the stretches today. After this, I'm gonna show you three um, good stretches, which is a great place to start. And once you get the hang of that, if you wanted um, like additional strength training, feel free to come in talk to me. We can always do something from there, okay? Uh, and then lastly, I just wanna remind everybody to seek treatment when you're injured, okay? I see it far too often. People are waiting weeks, months, in some cases, like years upon years before they're getting care. And I can't stress enough that tissues change over time. And the longer that we're delaying treatment of that tissue, the harder it is for us to get at some of these tissues um, and revert back to kind of a healthier position in a, in a healthier overall um, setup. Okay, so if you do have an injury, please seek, seek care as soon as you can. Okay, so let's dive into some of the stretches. The first one is called pigeon pose. I put this one in here particularly for that piriformis syndrome. This guy gets right in there. It's a great yoga stretch. Um, and if you're having a difficult time with this one, I'd, I put a figure four in here, which is a great way to start. And then you can work your way into this. Uh, and here you can see her position's really good and she even uses a bit of a block to sit on, right? So the goal here would be that her right leg is feeling the, the stretch through the glute um, in, in the front of the, the hip and then the left side right through that piriformis, okay? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna set up my camera a little bit so you guys can see. I'm gonna go do one on the ground here, okay? Okay, so the goal here is as you go down, you would start in something like a lunge, move back, okay. And then you're gonna bring your hip, um, or sorry, your ankle across in the front, and then you can use your arms to stabilize, okay? And some people can already feel it here. And if that's the case for you, great. But as you go, slowly progress, right? So I'm gonna let this back leg come out, and then I'm gonna slowly sink down and down. And I can really feel that on my left side. And if you need more, you can bring this foot in the front more forward, 
okay? So kind of changing this angle is gonna change the amount of stretch, okay? So that's a great way to start. I have a question that came up. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay? Um, with the pigeon pose, is it okay to bring your forehead down to the ground? It would be okay. Um, it, I would like for you to engage your core kind of like she is in this position. But for the terms of like getting into the hip, you can still totally stretch out the hip if you are leaning forward. That's not a problem. Yep. Okay. Um, um, there's the follow up one. How long um, should each stretch be held on gym pose? Perfect. That's a really great question. sound cutting out. Oh, yeah, a little again? bit. That's okay. I, I think I heard. How long should the stretch be held for? So um, our goal is to reach two minutes. It doesn't have to be a consecutive two minutes. So you could do kind of 30 seconds to a minute on one side, switch to the other side, do 30 seconds. But in the end, I want you to get two minutes for each side. Okay. Um, and then you don't have to do these every day but maybe three, four times a week, if you could do that, that'd be a great. What happens if you hold it for too long? Um, you can start to approach basically injury if you're really pushing it. Um, but if, if you're keeping out of a pain-free range of motion, so for example, if you went four minutes, it wasn't really bothering you or hurting, I'd say you're doing okay. Let's not push to the point of um, you're pushing too far and the pain starting to build up. We want stretches to be pain-free, okay? Um, I hope that helps. Looks like it did. Perfect. Thank you for your question. I appreciate that. Okay, we're gonna move on to the psoas stretch. I really love this one. Um, basically a deep lunge. And if I could just nitpick this picture a little bit, my recommendation is to really push that glute forward because as you can see on the skeleton here, that muscle goes in front of the hip. So the further you push that hip forward, the more stretch you're gonna feel, okay? You don't have to lift up the foot with this one. Um, it's just one of the you know, ways to just add a bit more tension. So I'll show you guys how to do this one. So if I'm going to stretch my right side, that's, foot, that's the foot that's gonna go back, okay? And then as I do the lunge, I'm gonna step out kind of a bit further in front of me because I wanna lean in and I wanna push this glute forward, okay? So as you squeeze that glute in, you should feel the stretch in the front of the hip. If you wanna add more, either pull that leg up or what I like to do is you can lean your chest away. And what you're doing here is you're trying to separate the two ends of the muscle. So one is into the spine here, and the other one is all the way into the front of the hip. So we're trying to elongate that as much as possible, by pushing the glutes in and leaning away. And again, you can hold this for about 30 seconds or so and switch sides. And then it would just be, you know, doing each one up to two minutes. I think we got another question. Okay, so I stretch. Is lying flat on your tummy on the floor and then bringing the foot to touch your bum on the, um, the same as this stretch in the picture, it would be very similar, but again, it's harder to press that hip forward because you're hitting the floor. So um, if, if you're flexible enough to kind of get back there and pull your foot, or if you're using a belt or a psoas, then by all means, you're probably getting this muscle. If you're feeling the stretch on the front of the hip, I would recommend you try this one to really push that hip forward and see if you're getting more of a stretch out of it. Okay. Okay. And then figure four. So this is the third one. So this is a great stretch um, that kind of has various stages based on flexibility. Okay. So I'm going to show you how to do this. So if we lie down on our backs, like so, the first thing you'll do is you'll bring one ankle across the knee of the other one, okay? And then from here, you're gonna take your arms and you're gonna reach through and grab the hamstring of the, the bent leg. And then you can pull it up towards you. And the stretch should be not on the leg that you're grabbing, it should be on this opposite side, 
and you should feel it through the back of the leg in towards your glute. So if I pull that one in, I can feel it about here, and it's stretching all the way along into the side of the glute. Renee, could you hear me okay? <laughs> I felt like I was yep. kind of far from the mic. Okay, yep. perfect. So, so for figure four, that's a great way to just get into the glutes, into the piriformis a little bit and stretch everything out. Again, you're gonna have to do both sides because this one, it's a, it's a one-sided stretch. Okay, perfect. So I think that covers all of my stretches for today. I hope that gives you guys a really great place to start. And again, if you want to add in strength training, that sort of stuff, you can always come visit me. I'm at the Westman Village Center um, in Mahogany. Um, so yeah, come on by and I'd love to, to chat with anyone. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I just want to clarify that my sound is okay uh, now. Okay, great. Um, there is one more question about the figure four. Uh, does it matter if the leg that is not crossed is up? Um, like the hamstring stretch, or is it best to be like in the picture? Um, would that touch on the range of motion for each individual? The leg that is not crossed is up. Oh, I see. Um, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't matter so much. Really, it's the cross leg that we're stretching in that in that regard. So if the other leg is down or bent, not as big of a concern. Really, what you're looking for is just trying to get that figure four. Um, shape. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, how do you differentiate between lower back pain and hip pain? Okay. My dog? Um, so in practice, we would do, um, first we'd ask a couple questions. If that doesn't differentiate it from there, um, we do a bunch of what we call uh, orthotic tests. So I would test your back with, for example, something like a straight leg raise, and then I would test your hip with, there's, there's many different tests, but for example, like a, a thigh thrust. And what I would be doing is I would be stressing the tissue in the joint of, of your back, and then I would separately test the tissue in the joint of your hip joint. And I would see, can I reproduce your main symptoms um, by stressing one or the other tissue? Okay, and sometimes the tests are positive for both, in which case we might be looking at something like a nerve that's crossing both areas. So then we would go into kind of additional tests. So how could you tell at home? I really recommend that you do go see somebody for that and, and just get a professional opinion on, on where exactly your pain is coming from. Um, I don't really want to say one thing at home because it, there, there's a lot that goes into it. So yeah, um, that's how as a as a doctor we would we would assess that. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any more questions? I'm not seeing any one quite yet. Um, in the meantime. I will uh, mention that Dr. Uh, Evan Steinke, you, you have two more webinars mm -hmm. coming up yeah. to round up the year. Uh, in November, we will be talking, or he, uh, Dr. Evan will be talking uh, all about the knee. Mm -hmm. And uh, December, we're looking at ankles. Um, the dates aren't, uh, you'll be able to find the dates in the newsletter. Um, and then you want to sign up separately for each one. Um, so when the newsletter comes in your inbox, sign up um, in November for November's and December for December's. I yeah. uh, think that is all. I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, if you have any further questions or would like that personal assessment, be sure to call AST Westman. Um, Dr. Evans put the information on the screen. There will also be a follow-up email with the links to uh, make an appointment if you're so inclined. We also will be sharing uh, the, the YouTube link for last month's lower extremity lecture in the email that will be coming. If you've missed that, you can uh, go ahead and watch it at your convenience. Um, I think that is all. Uh, we wanna say thanks to everyone that joined us today. Yes. Um, your time and attention is something that is not taken for granted, and we truly appreciate the support. Dr. Evan, thank you so much for all the content and information. Thank you.
dedication. Definitely, um, these webinars have been fantastic. Um, yes, and I wish everyone a wonderful night. Yes, thanks Enjoy. for coming, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Good night. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody.